Okay, now we're moving into part two. Now part two picks up the next day. Now Wesley begins to formally investigate the accusation against Frank, and he does this in the Coffee Cup, which is the name of a diner in downtown Bent Rock. Um, he's with several other men who make up the business community, as well as Ollie Young Bear, who is the most respected, even beloved Indian in northeastern Montana, perhaps even the whole state. Now, David checks in on Marie at home. He turns on the radio for her, hoping that Marie will be able to hear her music when she work, which is pretty cute. Uh, but that night, Wesley talks to Marie privately. Now, while David waits with his mother outside in the backyard, he is conflicted about confronting her uh, with the reality of the situation and what he knows already. Now, despite already knowing what's happened, he wants his mother and his parents to be open with him, and he reflects, I suppose I'd wanted adult status. And he believes he would get this by being included. Now, ultimately, he doesn't uh, confront Gail. He just asks her a couple of vague questions about what's going on, and his mother is equally vague in her answers and just talks about the wind. Uh, but David realizes this is because she wanted a few moments of purity, a temporary escape from the sordid drama that was playing itself out in our house. But I was on the trail of something that would lead me out of childhood. So you're probably already getting this, this sense and this impression that David's journey is certainly one of maturation, of being ripped from the world of childhood and thrust into the adult world with all of its corruption and messed upness. Now the following Sunday, the Hayden family are on their way to the grandparents' ranch. Now evidently Marie is well enough to be left on her own. Despite going, Gail is resistant, knowing that Frank and his wife Gloria will be there, so clearly she doesn't want anything to do with them. Now, upon arriving, we finally meet Big Papa Hayden, Julian Hayden, um, whom David describes as towering there like a thundercloud. Now, the relationship between Julian and Gail seems a bit strained. He talks about farting too much, apparently. <laughs> Now, Gail and David both go inside, but David stays by the door, and again, he is eavesdropping. Now, Wesley and Julian talk about Frank trying to have kids. Now, Julian's general vibe is that he wants more grandkids, and his racism is made pretty clear when he says, we want them white. Now, he also alludes to the fact that even in Frank's youth, he was attracted to and having sex with Native American uh, girls, whom he refers to as red meat. During dinner, David's weird, incestuous sexual relationship to Aunt Gloria suggested when he reflects, why would Uncle Frank want another woman when he had a wife like Gloria? And this line of thought was nudged by my own desire. I thought Aunt Gloria was more than pretty. So it's pretty clear where his line of thought is going. He thinks of Gloria as one more reason to envy Uncle Frank. Now after dinner, David decides to go riding on his horse Nutty, who he keeps at his grandparents' ranch. But Julian gives him an automatic pistol and a box of cartridges and tells him to shoot any coyotes if he sees them. Now taking the offerings, David goes riding on the horse, Nutty, um, and he finds a place far away where he does some random shooting at pine cones, at branches, um, that kind of thing, even on the ground just to see if it will make the dirt fly or something. But then he kills a magpie, uh, which prompts a feeling that is an extraordinary mixture of power and sadness, exhilaration and fear, which is pretty dark. He also says, I hadn't even known it, but I needed to kill something. Okay, very dark. His realization is that I realized that these strange, unthought of connections, sex and death, lust and violence, desire and degradation are there. There, deep in even a good heart's chambers. So this implies pretty strongly the disintegration of David's innocence and this building corruption and traumatization of his worldview. But hold on, it gets worse. Now, on his way back to the ranch, David sees his father and his uncle Frank at a riverbank. And though he can't hear what they're arguing about, he can see that they're gesturing angrily at one another. And speaking over the other's words. Now, he speculates that it's about Marie's allegations, and so he dismounts Nutty, creeps closer, and though he still can't hear them, he hides and aims his gun at Frank. Now, he knows that the gun is unloaded, but still, these are his thoughts. My first question wasn't, could I pull the trigger? It was, could I, from that distance, with that weapon, under those conditions, the wind, the slope of the hill, hit my target? And also, if I killed my uncle, would everyone's problems be solved? Would my father be relieved? Could I get away with it? Damn, son! Remember, this kid is 12 years old, so it's, it's pretty dark. Thug life. 
Now on the drive back to Bent Rock from the ranch, now Wesley confesses to talking to Frank, but all he says is that Frank has agreed to cut it out, which is the kind of thing you say when you're like flicking someone's ear or like parking someone, not friggin' sexual assault. So it just goes to show how desperately Wesley's trying to trivialize and make less severe the, the extent of Frank's crimes. Now, he really doesn't want to make a big deal out of it. Now, Gail naturally is dissatisfied with this. She reminds him that sins, crimes, are not supposed to go unpunished. Now, David notices what the irony of the conversation was. The secretary lecturing the lawyer, the law enforcement officer on justice. But even so, Wesley is reluctant to punish his brother. All he says of Frank is that he'll have to meet his punishment in the hereafter. I won't do anything to arrange it in this life. Mate, he's not even religious. In any case, despite investigating, we can see that Wesley is still very reluctant to acknowledge Frank's crimes and exercise his role as the sheriff. Now, having returned home, Marie is found with Doris Looksaway, who is a Native American friend who was watching her. It is declared that Marie is better, but not perfect. She asks David if he went riding and saw a coyote, um, and he says, no. She says, he's hard to see when you look for him. Hmm. Who or what else could that apply to? I'll let you think about that one. Symbolism. Now, in any case, these are Marie's last words to David. Uh, by the following Monday, August 13, 1948, Marie Little Soldier is found by Gail to be dead in her bed. Now David comes home from fishing and sees the hearse taking her body. Frank's pickup is also there. Now David's response isn't dramatic. He simply hangs his fishing equipment and his fish in the garage and he simply goes inside desensitized. He's completely numb. All he sees is that Wesley is on the phone, Gail is at the table, gloomy, and Frank is filling out a death certificate. Now, Gail embraces David, Wesley tells him formally that Marie is dead, but all David can think about is that he smells like fish. David writes, I smelled like fish, and that was the reason I didn't belong in this room. It was that, and not the secret I held, the fearful knowledge. Now, Daisy McCauley, the neighbor, she barges in, asking what's going on. Now, Frank explains that it was likely pneumonia and that Marie's deteriorating health was likely due to the perception that the Indian way is to deny illness to try to push through the face of it. Now, Wesley explains that he needs to notify Marie's family, and in that moment, David sympathizes with him because he acknowledges that Wesley becomes the one toting around a basket of grief looking for a doorstep to deposit it on. Daisy tells David to go and eat a blueberry pie and ice cream over at her place. Um, obviously, she wants to speak to Gail alone and get David out of the house. And we also get the impression that Gail is blaming herself for not taking good enough care of Marie. Aw, Gail. Now, indeed, David goes next door and sees a drunken Len McCauley who reiterates something that he learned from David's grandfather, Julian since, remember, he served him as a deputy. And he also says that this is a lesson that Wesley has yet to learn, which is knowing when to look and when to look away. Now, obviously, he's implying here that Wesley should not be investigating his brother. He also seems regretful that in his time as deputy, he never called Julian out on how he raised his sons or how he treated the general public, um, in particular, the young Native American boys. Now, he thought about it, but he didn't say anything. At this point, David leaves, and Len tells him to take care of his mother, which prompts him into thinking that Len is in love with his mother. Now that night, David can't sleep. He goes to his parents' bed, and he confesses that he saw Frank before Marie was found dead. Now during his fishing trip, he says that he went on a bathroom break using the Macaulay outhouse, their neighbors, um, and from there he saw Frank heading towards town, coming from the direction of their house, and he had his medical bag with him. Now, Wesley tries to press him for more information to see if he actually saw Frank coming from the house itself. He's got his sheriff hat on, um, and David notices he was now my interrogator, my cross-examiner, the sheriff, my uncle's brother. So not acting like his father. Now, as such, Gail dissuades Wesley. The implication is clear enough, at least to her. Despite this, however, Wesley starts putting the pieces together, but in such a way that would exonerate his brother rather than prove his guilt. Upon further questioning, however, David admits that Len might have seen Frank as well, 
Um, and this makes Wesley more resolute, albeit a little nervous, because he believes that if Len is silent, he will still be subject to the man's judgment. And he says, I'm not going to live with that look. David is then instructed to go back to bed. Now, despite sort of confessing everything, David still can't sleep that night. He thinks about the Native American community, how they are objects of the most patronizing and debilitating prejudice, but nevertheless are a largely passive and benign presence in the community. He dreams about them gathering on a hill, Circle Hill, from the top of which the entirety of Bent Rock is visible. He imagines them gathering not in anything as dramatic as a common pursuit to avenge Marie's death, but simply milling about, talking low, mourning Marie. Now part two ends with David falling asleep to the mental image of the Native American community walking the top of Circle Hill.